This is section 4, Security and Authentication. In this section, we're going to take a look at using HTTPS to secure your services, using Let's Encrypt to acquire HTTPS certificates, using Access Token to authenticate the users of our services, using JWT as access tokens, and we'll also be looking at some general security guidelines. This is video 1, HTTPS and TLS. In this video, we're going to take a look at how TLS handshakes use public key cryptography to start communications, why are certificate authorities needed, how to use HTTPS in our applications, and using self-signed certificates to test our applications, and customizing our HTTPS configuration to comply with Mozilla guidelines. There's a disclaimer to these videos. Uh, the contents of the following video are intended as an introduction to secure an HTTP endpoint with HTTPS. It is not intended as a definitive guide. If your application deals with the sensitive data, consider consulting the advice of a security professional. Also, consider new vulnerabilities are discovered every day in security practices and in software libraries. So the advice provided here might be obsolete and insecure by the time you read it. TLS, or Transport Layer Security, is a recommended protocol for establishing secure communications on the internet. It has superseded SSL, Though sometimes both terms are interchangeably, this is important. SSL has been is considered obsolete by now because uh, vulnerabilities were found, so TLS has replaced SSL. TLS starts with a mechanism known as a TLS handshake. We're not going into the detail of how this works. Uh, there are some links you can look at in the readme of the video. The first step of this mechanism use public key cryptography. We're going to look at a little at this so that we understand why certificate authorities are needed for TLS. A quick introduction to public key cryptography. In public key cryptography, there are two elements. The public key that is freely distributed by the server. We're talking about HTTP communication, so we're going to be talking about the server. And a private key that is only known by the server. Cryptography, when Alice and Bob, we will, we will have two users, we will call them Alice and Bob. Bob will be our server, Alice will be our client. Alice starts a communication with Bob. She doesn't know Bob. It's the first time she communicates. When Alice communicates with Bob, Bob sends Alice his public key. Bob has both public and private keys. After that, Alice knows Bob's public key and Bob has both his public and private key. What is important thing about it is that a message encrypted with a public key can only be decrypted with a private key. So now that Alice knows Bob's public key, she can encrypt messages with, with Bob's public keys, send them to Bob, and the only person that um, will be able to, to unencode, to undecrypt the message will be Bob. On the other hand, a message signed with a private key can be verified by anyone with a public key. So, if Alice sends Bob a message that was encrypted with Bob's public key, and Bob decrypts the message, and then signs the message with his private key, then Alice will be able to know that the message was, is actually coming from Bob, because Bob is the only one that, can, that, that has that private key, of, which was used to sign the message. Now, there is a problem with this. It's that Alice and Bob are communicating through the internet, and the internet is an insecure network, an insecure network. So the following thing might happen, which is called a man-in-the-middle attack. Let's suppose there's someone who is able to intercept communications from Alice to Bob, and who is capable of putting himself in the middle between the communications of Alice and Bob. We will call him Mark. Mark intercepts communications between Alice and Bob, and when Alice tries to connect to Bob, instead of receiving Bob's public key, she receives Mark's public key. Then Alice will think that Mark's public key is Bob's and believes she's communicating with Bob. On the other hand, Bob will think that he's communicating with Alice because Mark is able, since he's in the middle, he's able to to send Bob messages pretending to be Alice. The problem with this will be that if this is the case, then Mark will be able to know all of the communications that happen with this, between Alice and Bob, and also to be able to tamper the messages, to change the messages that Alice receives from Bob and then Bob receives from Alice, and also to decide uh, which messages do Alice and Bob receive from each other. To prevent this, we use certificate authorities. So what are certificate authorities? Certificate authorities are trusted third parties that will provide Bob with a public key certificate that will, when Bob sends his, his public key certificate to Alice, Alice can verify 
with the certificate authority certificate that Bob's public key certificate was valid. And after that, Alice will be sure that Bob is Bob and not Mark. How does this happen? Well, certificate authorities' own, own certificates are distributed with operating systems or browsers. So Alice has the Certificate Authority certificate in her own machine. For example, in Linux, uh, you can list all of the certificates that reside, they reside at, etc. SSL certs. Let's look at this. Well, there's plenty of them. For example, we have VeriSign. We have Visa, and there's a lot of others. All of these are distributed with the operating system, so these are common to everybody using this operating system. There was one problem with certificate authorities, is that certificate authorities charge for providing public key certificates. So uh, that used to be a problem, but now there's a service called uh, Let's Encrypt that we're going to be using in the next video. That is free. You don't necessarily need to buy a certificate or use Let's Encrypt. If you're using Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, or some other hosting providers, providers they also provide free HTTPS to be used by server hosted on their infrastructure. Another option is to use a reverse proxy like Caddy, or sometimes Nginx is used uh, as a reverse proxy to, to serve HTTPS. Since we don't have a certificate, uh, well, and for testing purposes, we're going to generate our own self-signed certificate. These are not signed by a certificate authority, we're just using, we are signing them ourselves. Uh, this is good for testing, but you should never do this in production. Always use an, an approved certificate authority, approved certificate public key provided by a certificate authority. Remember that in next video, we're going to look at how to use uh, Let's Encrypt. So we're going to know how to use free uh, certificate certificates. Uh, but well, now we're going to be using self-signed certificates. To do that, first we're going to create a search certificate in our home directory. All of the things that we're doing here uh, can be found in the readme of the course. The first thing we do is we generate uh, through RSA and I open SSL, we generate a server key. We then run this. And after that, we generate the server key and server pen. If we look, we have the server key and the server pen. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for our client. You should copy the server keys and the client keys to the folders that we're going to be using. Uh, we are on video one of section four from the course repository. See that we have the server key and PAM in the server folder and we have the same in the, in the client. Now let's look at using those certificates in, in our program. Uh, remember that this is, we're using self-signed certificates. Always use re uh, certified certificates, not self-signed. Let's look at what we're doing. We are calling the function, instead of calling listen and serve, we're calling the function listen and serve TLS. Here we provide the certificate path, the PEM, which is here, which in this case is server.pem because it's in the same uh, directory, in the same folder, and then we have the key path. Uh, so basically it's the same as we had before. Instead of calling listen and serve, we call listen and serve TLS and we provide the certificates. We're starting it on port 8443 because 443 can only be started by, by a sudo, by, a, by the root, and we're running this in, in user space, in the, as a user, no, not in user space, but as a user. We have one simple handle function that basically says hello world from HTTPS. This is our server. So we're going to run it. And we also have a client. Uh, let's look at the client. The client will make a request through HTTPS. We load the, the TLS key pair as certificate. Here we have the certificate path and the key path. This function reads some parts though, well, you can, we can regular more documentation, but basically what we're doing is we're creating a certificate with the certificates we're using. 
in the client, we're going to define a transport. And in that transport, we're going to put the, the certificates that we have just created. So basically, we have the, the client certificates added to the client. Then we're doing a request through the client. We are calling localhost 8443 hello. And well, if there's an error, we log it. And basically, that's it. We're doing a request. We're getting a response. Whether printing the response, oh, the status, and the body after the response was done. So we have our server running. Uh, we're not going to try the client. This is an example one, video one of section four from the course repository. Uh, let's run. And let's see what, what message do we got. Oh, the a client re replied, uh, there was an error. The certificate is signed by unknown authority. This is expected because we have self-signed uh, the certificate. And let's see what the server has slide. The server says the same thing, TL TLS handshake error from remote error, TLS bad certificate. Let's test this on Chrome. We're going to be going to localhost, uh, HTTPS, localhost, um, port 8443, and we're calling the path hello. When we do this, uh, Google shows uh, a warning. I'm sure you have seen this before. Uh, this usually happens when a certificate has expired. Uh, in our case, it's happening because uh, we are using a self-signed certificate, so it's not secured. Uh, we see the the warning here and here, and also on this. But if we go through and we said, okay, we understand what we're doing, but we're going to proceed even though it's unsafe, we get the response from HTTPS. Remember that if you were using a certificate assigned, our authority assigned um, a certificate, you wouldn't have had this problem. We're using this for testing. But in this example, what we can do is, for example, in our client, uh, we could make it skip the validation. We can do this by adding the following line. Insecure skip verify. Now we save this and we go to the, to the client and we run we're actually getting hello world from HTTPS. The other thing we could do, it's add the server certificate to a list of certificate authorities trusted by the client and doing the same in the, in the client. To this, the following needs to happen. We're going to run a command with OpenSSL. We're going to check out the server fam and see the details. If we see the details of the server of fam, we see, well, it has, Signature algorithm, the algorithm that was used to sign, the issuer, uh, the validity. It has 10 years of validity. Um, this public key. And the important thing is here where it says certificate authority, it should be set to true. This means that since it was self signed, it's uh, we're adding this certificate as if it was a certificate of a certi certificate authority. So, an example two, what we're doing. We're adding the server uh, public key to the to the client folder. We're doing the same thing to the server. Uh, we're adding the client to the server, the client certificate to the server. And in our code, we create a search pool, which is a, a pool of certificates, authorities. We append uh, the server certificate. We're on the client. We append the server certificate. And then we add the root CAs as the pool we have just created. We do the same thing on the server. Um, the process is very similar. We add the certificate, we read the certificate, we add it to, we create a cert pool, we append that certificate to the cert pool, and then on the configuration, we add that cert pool as the client certificates authorities. So if we run this, we won't have the problem we had before. This is a server, we're going to run the server. It's example two. Uh, we're on example two. We run the server. And now we are on the client. We are on the client. We run the client. And there were no problem. That is because we added our own self signing certificate as a certificate authority to the list of certificate authorities that both the client and the, and the server accept. 
this could be useful for testing uh, when you do an internal. But remember, always use a certificate authority provided uh, certificate on production. The last thing we're going to see in this video, it's uh, there's there are three of guidelines that you should follow when doing TLS. Um, they are provided by Mozilla. They provide different guidelines to how to you uh, to what options of TLS you're using to make it uh, secure uh, according to current standards. Uh, these guidelines change from time to time because some algorithms uh, are found to be uh, insecure or things like that happen. You know, it you should follow the guide here. There are three different recommended configurations, modern, intermediate, and old. Google's default is the intermediate compatibility. If you want to set it to modern compatibility so that we have more security, we have an example on server two. Basically, we have the on the configuration of the of the TLS config. Uh, we are determining a minimum version. We are determined to use core preferences, uh, the ones that are considered safe. Uh, the cipher suits are the actual well the suits for encryption that they're used. Uh, we have plenty. This one needs to be added because it's required by um, HTTP two. But well, those are the, the ones we are using. And well, in the case you you are using TLS, it's always a good idea to actually check with the Mozilla guidelines to see what's what are the current preferred configurations.